We're going to be in Acts chapter 27 today, so if you would like to go ahead and open your Bibles to Acts chapter 27. Um, Really, I'm just so thankful to be here in the presence of God this afternoon. How many of you are thankful for that, that we get to be in the presence of God, unashamed? Uh, We can come boldly before the presence, knowing that we have been saved by a holy God. I think any time that we just get to gather together in unity because of what Jesus has done through us is, is an awesome thing. Um, so Acts 27, that's where we're going to be today. Um, believe it or not, we are ending, nearing the end of the book of Acts. So next week is actually going to be the last week that will be in Acts. And in San Antonio, we started this series in February of last year. And, um, I know a lot has changed over this past year. Uh, Y'all here at the church have been through a lot around the world. A lot has changed. Uh, But really the biggest change over the last year, I think, is uh, the way Pastor Matt looks. Uh, I think I have a, if you could kind of see, maybe not. Uh, if, If the projector looked better, he looks very bald with his face on the left side. And on the right side, he's, you know, got this big lumberjack beard now. Um, I I would say it's a lumberjack beard. Compared to what I can grow, it's a lumberjack beard. Um, But in all seriousness, y'all have been through a lot as a church over the last year. I mean, a new church, a new church name, two new pastors, COVID, uh, an ice storm, and y'all are still here and faithful to this church. And I think that's something to celebrate is that y'all are a faithful body of Christ. And I'm thankful for that. When, whenever I get to be up here, it's just such a, uh, an honor and a blessing to see all of you. Um, so today we're going to look at, in Acts 27, one of the most famous storms that has ever been recorded. In fact, it's one of the most detailed accounts of a shipwreck that we have in all of ancient history. And so as, as I was getting ready for this passage this week and looking at it and trying to see how we could break it up, I really didn't see any way to split it up other than to read the entire chapter. Okay, so I'm going to read all of Acts chapter 27, and then we'll unpack some truths from that. So let's go ahead and... Start In Acts 27, verse 1, it says, And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramitium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon. And Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia... And Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Snidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmon. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives." But the centurion paid more attention to the plot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, 
a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. So real quick, this harbor that they were at in Fair Havens, this was a smaller harbor that there really wasn't a lot going on in that town. And once the winter months hit, the sea was really unsailable for about three months. And so it wasn't preferable for the, the sailors and all of these prisoners to, they, they really didn't want to spend three months in this small town. So they tried to make it to the port of Phoenix, which was about 40 miles away, which would have been more accommodating for this large group. So verse 13 says, Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave to it and were driven along. Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run aground on the citrus, they lowered the gear, and thus they were driven along. Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have found, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we must run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on they took a sounding and again found fifteen fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under pretense of laying out anchors from below, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength. For not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then all were encouraged, and at some and ate some food themselves. We were in all two hundred and seventy six persons in the ship, and when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow stuck and remained immovable, and the stern was being broken up by the surf. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, 
and the rest on the planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word with our congregation today. Lord, speak through me today. Lord, I pray that the truths that we look at today would have an impact on our hearts. Lord, that we would be transformed by the word of God today. In Jesus' name, amen. So today I've got three points that I'd like to share with you. Three truths that I'd like to unpack. There could be more in such a passage as this, but I'll keep it at three today. And the first point, the first big takeaway I have today that I want to look at is that God knows how to protect his people. God knows how to protect his people. This was a terrible storm. This, was, this wasn't just a, a light rain that, that happened over two weeks. This was a monumental storm. And these were trained professionals that spent their entire lives at sea. These sailors weren't just a ragtag of individuals that were hired to carry these prisoners. These guys knew what they were doing. And they had tried everything to save the ship. And finally, it says that they had lost all hope, that after they had tried everything, they had given up hope that their lives would be spared. Now, this was a monumental storm. I don't know if any of you have seen the movie, The Perfect Storm, but in it, there's kind of this impossible wave that the, boats, the boat goes on, and it just looks like there's no way that could be real. I picture that this was even worse than that. There, there really should not have been any survivors in this storm. But in this story, we see that God protected his people. Now, we know that Paul was on this boat. We know that Luke was also on the boat as he is telling this account. And Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. And from everything we've seen in Acts so far, we know that Paul is a child of God. But we also see it in this passage. In verse 23, it says, For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. Paul knew who he belonged to. Paul belonged to God. And belonged can be defined as being the property of. Paul was God's property. And Paul knew that God was going to take care of his property. God was going to protect what was his. In verse 24, Paul goes on to say, as an angel appears to him, he says, the angel said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar and behold, God had granted you all those who sail with you. Now, the angel who was speaking on behalf of God, he says that you must stand before Caesar. Now, I know Paul was a, a cl pretty clever guy, and he knew that a dead man could not stand before Caesar, right? So with this angel telling him that he must stand before Caesar... It gave Paul the confidence that he knew that God had a plan for his protection. Now, a few weeks ago, I spoke here on Acts 23. And if you can recall, we, we looked at how Paul was um, in the barracks in Jerusalem, in the Roman barracks, and how he had been through this whole ordeal. And in that moment, Jesus himself physically appeared to Paul and told him that he would preach in Rome. So we knew that God had planned for Paul to make it to Rome. And here again, we see the angel on behalf of God reminding him that God had a plan to preserve Paul's life so that he could make it to Rome. So there was no way that, God, that Paul was going to die during this storm. There was just no way it was going to happen. Because if that were the case, if Paul would have died, the implications would have been drastic. That would have meant that God had either changed his mind, which we know that scripture says that God never changes his mind. If Paul would have died in this storm, it would have meant that God was a liar, which scripture tells us God is not a liar. 
Or even worse, it would have meant that God was not in control of all things. But with God preserving Paul's life, we see that God did not change his mind. We see that God was telling the truth and that God is in control of all things. And so in this, we see God's divine protection of his people in this passage. Now, quickly, I want to look at what God tells his people, the Israelites, in Isaiah chapter 41. In Isaiah 41, verses 8 through 10, it says this, But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So in the first part of Isaiah 41, what is happening is we see God speaking judgment over the nations, those who are worshiping other idols, those who are living a life of idolatry. But God tells his people, his possession, those who belong to him, not to fear. And here we see that God will protect those whom he has chosen. In Daniel chapter 3, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had survived the the human barbecue, right? They, They had been thrown into the fire. The flames had been cranked up seven times hotter than before. After that, we see King Nebuchadnezzar. After they had survived, they had been spared. King Nebuchadnezzar says this, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any other god except their own god. God was their god. God was the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were his children. And we see this all throughout Scripture, God's divine protection for his chosen people. We see it in the life of Joseph, time after time after time in his life, where it looked like he was in the midst of the storm, where it looked like things were going to go wrong for him. We see that God protected him for a purpose. The same with Moses, how God divinely led him in a basket to Pharaoh's daughter, And with Noah, how God divinely protected him in the midst of a storm as well. So we see that God protects his possession. God protects those who belong to him. Now, you might be in here thinking today, I know that's true. I know you've pointed out examples where God protects his people. But what about the disciples? Didn't the disciples all die a martyr's death? Didn't they all die gruesome deaths? How were they protected? Or not only the disciples, what about the Christians who died in the Roman Colosseums? Or what about modern day martyrs like Jim Elliott? Or maybe you know people who have died in the faith that really died before we thought they should have. How were these people protected? Well, I would suggest before you today that there is no greater protection than that of the soul. What is better than protection from the fires of hell itself? May these words of Jesus from John 6 comfort you today and encourage you. In John 6, verses 38 through 40, Jesus says this, For I have come down from heaven... Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, 
and I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus didn't say that some that look on me will have eternal life. He says everyone that looks on me, everyone who believes in Jesus will be raised up on the last day. All who belong to Jesus are secure. That's what Jesus was talking about when he was the good shepherd, that he was not going to let one of his sheep perish. And so for us today, we can be encouraged that we know that God is going to protect us in the midst of the storm. And that no matter what we face and we have received and we have inherited as his children, an eternal protection, a protection of our souls that Jesus is not going to let slip out of his hands. So that's point number one, that God knows how to protect his people. The second point I'd like to look at today is Paul's confidence in the storm. Paul says in verse 22, Yet I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Now, where did this confidence come from? Telling, telling them to take heart. They were in the midst of a deadly storm. They had tried everything to save the ship. They got rid of the cargo, they got rid of the supplies, they had secured the escape boat and tied that up. Nothing that they were doing was working. They hadn't seen the sun or the stars for many days. Now, I'm, I've never even been out at sea or on a boat. I, um, that's something that I just really can't get down with because I... I get seasick tying my shoes sometimes, so going out on the water doesn't sound great to me. But I imagine that the sailors, they relied on seeing the stars or seeing where the sun was for their navigation. So they, they didn't know really where they were. This was a big boat. There was 276 passengers, none of which had eaten for many days. Now, Luke doesn't give us exactly the reason why they hadn't eaten, but they hadn't made seasick patches back then. So I can imagine that the passengers were probably sick to their stomach after many, many days of the waves just pounding this boat. And we do know that there was food on the boat because this was an Egyptian grain boat that they used to transport grain, and later we see that they ate. But that's the picture of what's going on. You had seasick passengers, probably all sorts of projectiles on the floor of the ship. You had the waves crashing for many days. You couldn't see the sky. You couldn't see the sun. You couldn't see the stars. And Paul stands there and says, take heart. We are going to be spared. No loss of life will occur. Where did this confidence come from? Well, we see that Paul was told by the angel that he must stand before Caesar. And this angel was speaking on behalf of God. In verse 25, it says, Paul says this, So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. And I believe that Paul had confidence in the midst of this storm, because Paul knew the word of God. But he didn't just know it, he trusted it. He believed it. He had faith in God's word. He had faith that in what the angel had told him on behalf of God, that he could trust and he could believe. It's one thing to know scripture. It's one thing to know God's word. Even the Atheists know God's word. A lot of atheists memorize scripture because they think they can use that to trump Christians and to get Christians in arguments. It's one thing to know God's word, but it's another thing to believe God's word. It's another thing to trust his word. It's another thing to put faith in what his word says. And that's what happened with Paul. Paul believed the word of God. And so the same must be true for us today. This book is everything for a Christian. 
This is all that we have to stand on. But we must spend time, we must spend time in his word daily. We must spend time in devotion with his word. Husbands and fathers, we need to spend time with our wives, with our kids, opening this word daily with our family. We have opportunities here at the church with KBI and obviously on Sundays opening the word for you to know God's word. But the studying of God's word, the studying of this book will only get us so far if we don't trust what it says. If we don't believe the words that are in here. If we're not being transformed by his word. If we're only taking in information. We must be transformed by the word of God. Paul says in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. He says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, I know this probably isn't the first time you've had a pastor tell you to get in the word more, study the word, know the word, be hearers and doers of the word. But it's so vital for our walk with God that we are in the word. But it's important for us as Christians to understand that it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that our minds can be renewed by the word. It's not something that we can just dig our heels in and say, which I have said many times and not walked it out. I'm going to read the word more today. I'm going to spend more time in devotion this week in God's word. It's one thing to say that, but it's important for us to understand that it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we are even drawn as Christians to desire to know God's word. It's only a miraculous transformation of the Holy Spirit that leads us to hungering for his word. And so it's important for us to know that because as you desire to study the word, as you desire to be transformed by God's word, it's important to ask the Holy Spirit to give you that desire, to ask the Holy Spirit to do a work in you that can lead you that can convict you of your sin, that can draw you to God's word. And in that, your mind will be renewed and it will help you not to be conformed to this world. And as you do that, just like Paul, when you know his word, when you trust his word, when you believe his word, it will give you confidence in the storm. And I've seen that personally in my life. Um, I'll be honest with you, when my dad passed away in 2012, I, I knew the word. I knew what his word says. I had, you know, memorized verses, but I didn't really understand God's word. I didn't really trust his word. I didn't really believe it as a foundation that I could stand on. And it really rocked my faith when my dad passed away. And thankfully, by the grace of God, through that, it it led me to wanting to really understand and know and trust and believe what his word says in a greater way. And I've seen now, as me and my family have experienced other storms since then, that it has given me a confidence in the midst of those storms to know that God was going to take care of me. And I'd also like to point out on this point with Paul's confidence in the storm that it allowed him to encourage the passengers with the word of God. These men were hopeless. Verse 20 says that all hope of their being saved was at last abandoned. But Paul built them up with the word of God. Paul told them to take heart and to take courage. These men were drowning. They were close to death, but Paul shared with them God's word. Paul shared with them the word that the angel speaking on behalf of God had shared with him, and he brought them hope. 
In a natural sense, he brought them salvation because they were about to give up all hope. And for us today, I think we can draw parallels from this scripture and that there are people in our lives who are without hope. There are people in our lives who are close to drowning in a way. Spiritual death is knocking at their door. They're hopeless. They're lost. The waves of life had made, have made them sick to their stomach and they've just been tossed and turned by the waves of life. And we have been given God's word to bring hope to the lost. In the same way that Paul brought hope to those passengers, we have been given God's word to bring healing to the lost. And that healing only comes through salvation in Jesus Christ. And so in the same way that Paul encouraged the passengers and brought salvation of their literal lives, we have been given God's word to share and to bring salvation to those who are lost around us. Amen? Amen. So point number two, Paul had confidence in the storm. Now, my last point that I have today is is a question that we can ask. And that question is, why doesn't God give Paul smooth sailing? Why didn't God just let Paul have this nice, relaxing sail to Rome? We know that the centurion had favor on him. He may or may not have been bound up and tightly wrapped and in you know, suffering quarters on this ship, Paul could have, God could have just given Paul a nice, smooth sailing, but that didn't happen. And over the last few chapters, we've literally seen one trial after another for Paul before he even makes it on this boat, and then culminating in this monumental storm. Now, why was this? We know that God was strong enough and powerful enough to calm the waves of this sea, In Mark chapter 4, Jesus speaks to the waves, and they become completely still. So we know that it was within God's power to calm the storm. So why cause this suffering? After all, we've seen that Paul is a child of God. We've seen that Paul does belong to God. So why would God want his people to be in a storm? Why would God want us, as we've seen in our lives, we go through storms. Why don't we as Christians just have smooth sailing? Why is it that once we're saved, it seems like we encounter one storm after another? Well, because like we see with Paul in this story, when we have storms in our life, it allows us to put our faith on display. Second Corinthians 1 verses 3 and 4, Paul says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Now, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. He wrote this letter four years before this instance happened with this storm at sea. And Paul had already endured many trials, as we've seen in Acts. In fact, later in 2 Corinthians, he kind of gives us a long list of everything that he's been through. For the sake of time, I won't go through all of it, but he mentions that he was beaten with rods, he was stoned, In this passage, he says three times he's been shipwrecked, so that can now be four times that he's faced shipwreck, that he's been shipwrecked. So why why does this happen to God's people? Because it allows us to put our faith on display. This passage in Psalms really rings true for Paul, and I pray that it rings true for us. Psalms 34, 19, it says this, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Paul had been through many storms in his life. In fact, it appears that once he is saved, 
it's just storm after storm after trial after trial. His whole ministry, his whole life of ministry seems to be trial after trial. But Paul had received comfort in all of his afflictions. He says in Corinthians, he's been comforted during these afflictions so that now he can comfort others, so that now he can encourage others, so that now he can put his faith on display and say, I know who my God is. Take heart. And that's exactly what he does in the midst of a hopeless situation here. He looks out at the passengers. He looks out at the captains. He looks out at the centurion. And he says, take heart. I know my God. I trust my God. So for us today, you might be going through something right now. There might be a monumental storm that you are facing in your life. And you might be wondering, what's the purpose of it? I'm faithful coming to church. I'm faithful in my tithes. I've been a Christian all my life. Why am I going through this? Why the friction? Why aren't things going right? Why does there seem to be drama with my boss at work? Why is this body ache that I have keep lingering? Why does my friend still have cancer? Why is the cancer still there? These are all questions that we may be asking. But I want to tell you today, if you are in Christ, you can be sure that God has you right where he wants you. And perhaps the reason you're facing these trials is that so like Paul, you can put your faith on display and encourage those around you that you know your God, you know what his word says, and not only do you know what his word says, but you trust in his word. Yes, it's hard. Of course, we'd all rather have a calm sea. We'd all love for our life just to be smooth sailing with no difficulties. But we know who our God is and we can stand on his word. We can trust in our God. And so in closing today, I want to ask you this. Are you a child of God? Do you trust and know his word? If so, you can be sure of two things. You're going to face storms in this life. But you can also be sure that you will not be alone in those storms. You can stand on his word. You can trust in his protection. And more importantly, you can trust in his eternal protection of your soul. And being confident of this, you can encourage others in the midst of their storms Knowing that God has preserved you, knowing that God has seen you through, you can encourage others in the midst of their storms. But I believe that we can also be an encouragement to others in the midst of our own storms. That as we're going through challenges, as we face things that come up, that as we stand on God's word, we can put our faith on display and we can encourage those around us. And as we do this, most importantly... Most important of all, we will bring glory to our God and our Savior. Amen? Amen. Well, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for this passage. God, this isn't just a story of a, of a shipwreck and someone surviving a shipwreck. This wasn't just some random storm that's in the Bible for us to, to know history. Lord, you wanted us to see the truths of this story. That you had a plan for Paul's life. And that no attack of the enemy, nothing was going to be able to thwart that plan. So Lord, we know that the same is true for us today. And God, we stand on that promise that you will take care of your people. That Lord, that the righteous will not be overcome. So God, I thank you today that we have the promise of our eternal security because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And Lord, I pray that we would walk out every day of our lives living in that confidence, the same confidence that Paul had in the midst of this storm to stand before sailors, to stand before prisoners, to stand before men who had done the worst of the worst,
that he still had the confidence to stand and proclaim the word of God, that we too would have that confidence in our lives. When even when things don't look good around us, that we can stand on the word of God and that we'll be, we will be faithful to living our lives in accordance to God's word. And as we do this, that you will be glorified and you will be magnified. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.